at the beginning of man's <coughs> intellectual life, <coughs> he depended almost entirely upon communication by word and example. Our earliest known forms of education were close to what we term apprenticeship. The individual simply learned by doing, by observing, and by following the patterns of his tribe. At this time, formal education as we know it could not exist. The individual unfolded into the maturity of his people, following their courses of action, inspired by their concepts and convictions, and his way is still preserved to us in the earliest periods of human life, the child, prior to the beginning of schooling, recapitulates the whole theory of ancient learning. He learns by becoming aware of the world around him and the circumstances under which he must gradually develop a pattern for living. With the invention of the written word, an entirely different situation arose, which was to affect not only the culture of man, but most directly and immediately his own internal life. The written word began with pictogram, in which the individual attempted to draw a picture of his ideas. These pictures were derived almost totally from nature around him and he was therefore limited in his inability to, met, to represent qualities which were intangible or for which there was no immediate natural symbol available. <clears throat> Gradually, however, he became acutely aware that he could transfer from one person to another a certain implication of qualities by the careful selection of his symbols. He learned, for example, that animals have certain characteristics reminiscent of human beings, and he could convey not only the person's appearance or physical propensities, but some of these overtones by involving a more penetrating analysis of the symbol that he used. From the true pictoglyphic or pictographic form of writing, he passed to the hieroglyph, and here he began the development of compound phrases, words, sentences, and began to use pictures to represent arbitrary letters of the alphabet. Thus spelling came to him, and from spelling gradually hieroglyph moved in her, into the hieratic forms in which the glyphs were gradually reduced to stenographic symbols from which we now have our alphabets. Now this entire process imposed upon man the need to learn to read. It was essential to him that he should share with others in the common knowledge of a series of characters, figures, symbols, devices, only when he shared these in common could he receive the benefit of common knowledge. Thus came reading. Reading also implied for the first time a period set aside for learning. Up to that time the child or the person simply grew and learned simultaneously. He grew while he learned, he played while he learned. Gradually, however, it was necessary for him to set aside a certain period of time in which to master this mysterious alphabet. It was not long before this became an involvement, and gradually there arose teachers, professional instructors in this simple procedure. They were sometimes called scribes or they may have been early in the way of things, merely priests or medicine uh, teachers, 
healers. Anyone who had this knowledge might transmit it. Under the Roman educational theory, parents were presumed to teach their children these basic instruments, and the child was not expected to go under professional tutoring until after he had mastered the rudiments of his three R's. Thus what we call primary education was for the most part still in the keeping of the family. We look back and we assume therefore that the Romans must have had more leisure than we had, that they had the time to take to give their children the advantages of education. Today, however, with all our labor-saving and time-saving devices, it would seem that we have less time than the ancient Roman, less time than the ancient Greek, and far less time than the ancient Chinese. We no longer, apparently, feel that we have the necessary leisure to devote to education. As this condition gradually increased, and we find the activities of the individual taking precedence over the instruction of the young, the lesser schools, the primary school concept came into being. And by degrees, we developed a theory of education that was founded essentially upon man's ability to read. Now what is the difference essentially between observation and experience as primitive man knew these things and the transferring or communicating of information through the art of reading. Well, the first, of course, we realize that between experience and the individual to receive it, a new instrument has been interposed between actual fact and actual desire to know has come this massive structure of what might be termed the intellectual middleman, the process of learning, by which the individual get, gradually gains control of the instruments and tools of his race, by which he is assumed to achieve a condition of education. We are now in this peculiar situation that for several thousands of years nearly all civilized peoples have been taught to read. They have been taught, therefore, that their most perfect means of communication, actually, is the written word, which not only makes available to them news in the sense of contemporary happening, but history in the sense of remote happening. <clears throat> Today, therefore, reading perpetuates for us that which the past could never know. Reading has also, to a degree, standardized the descent of knowledge. Knowledge passed on only by oral tradition was subject to constant change without censorship. Each generation added something or detracted something. And the final result of traditional knowledge was often confused, as we know from mythology which undoubtedly originated on an historical or philosophical level, but has gradually descended to folklore through perpetuation without control. Reading, however, if it has served us well, has also produced a curious psychic condition within the heart and mind of the reader. Gradually, he has come to associate ideas with words, he has also, in time, ultimately come to the substitution of word for idea. And this becomes a very serious problem. No adequate testing is available, but such indications as have accumulated would cause us to assume that for modern man, word and idea are practically synonymous terms. In other words, any statement in words becomes a statement in fact, if we think we know this is not true. But in common experience, we do not think that deeply. Therefore, we accept it as true. Therefore, we ask a question which involves within ourselves ideas. We read an answer, 
uh, which probably <clears throat> inferred to the person who gave it to us in written form also an idea. But in communication we have only words and gradually we come to accept a written definition or a series of word statements for dynamic facts. These words going into the mental equipment and meeting there the question that was asked. These words seem to answer the question. Therefore, we accept the answer in the term of a phrase, a statement, a definition, a truism. <laughs> and before we know what has happened, we discover that our own thinking has become word thinking. When we ask ourselves a question, we answer with a mental word concept. By degrees, the substitution of word concept for idea concept within ourselves has taken the vitality out of the answer. It has left us with nothing but formulas. Formulas which seem to satisfy certain intellectual needs. But these formulas are not always accompanied by an experienced dynamic. In other words, we do not feel, know, or experience the meaning of the word. To meet this problem, a number of dictionaries have come into existence. Dictionaries, among the first being Minshew's Guide to Tongues, that was printed about 400 years ago, dictionaries help us. But all they can do is give us usage. <clears throat> Johnson and Webster both acknowledge that a dictionary does not tell us the meaning of a word. It only tells us the usage. It tells us how other persons have used this word and in what context. We then make another important discovery and that is that words are comparatively meaningless out of context. We cannot simply take the word alone and make it live. It lives in a pattern. It must therefore be qualified by other words. Until gradually we gain a total concept of the, the original word picture that someone attempted to convey. Now as a word out of context lose meaning, loses meaning, it does not necessarily mean that it develops an inaccurate meaning. It develops what we might term a static meaning. It has a meaning which cannot be denied but which is not alive which causes no experience in us. Such a word, for example, we might say is true, probably one of the most abstract and powerful of all word thoughts. From the beginning of time, man has asked, what is truth? So he looks up this word, full of hope and optimism, and he finds in the dictionary that truth stands for reality or on another level, that a, a truth is a fact. So he ponders a little longer, and he looks up facts to see if he's on the right track. He looks it up in the dictionary, and he is told that a fact is a truth. <laughs> he is therefore captured. Now, if anyone should say, ask you what a truth is, you would probably explain to the best of your ability that it is something that is really so. But how much libido would there be behind the entire concept procedure? If someone in turn asks you what is really so, you will answer with another formula of words, perhaps by giving, giving an example. It is true that night follows day. It is true that water seeks its own level. These things are true, but what is true? All we have tried to do is to convey the impression of something factual. 
Now to the degree that we can escape from word limitation, we probably can bestow some dynamic upon a word. But today, this dynamic is utterly inadequate. And the only way in which we can learn and prove that we are learned is by remembering words. <clears throat> if we remember them as the professor told us, and then when he asks the question in an examination, we can write them out for him, we will pass the examination. What they mean, however, as living experience to us is exceedingly dim. And as a consequence of this, a large part of education has become exceedingly dull. It neither holds nor intrigues nor captures the mind. Now one of our great problems in words is the substitution of name for fact. A small boy points out of the window of the automobile and says, Daddy, what is that? Daddy replies quickly, easily, honestly, and completely, that, my boy, is a horse. What has he actually said? Factually, he has communicated to his child our general name for that particular quadruped. The boy knows absolutely nothing more about horse, however, than he did before. And that which he really knows about horse in this moment is what he has seen about horse. He saw the horse. That was important. From now on, he can identify the animal and the name, just as he might do it also from a series of alphabet blocks on which animals, birds, and other creatures are represented. But all of this moves on a level. It moves on a strange, dead level. We define appearances. We create names for new appearances. We put chemicals together in a new compound and then create a name for them by stringing out, either with or without hyphens, the names of the elements of the compound. Thus we convey a certain factuality about the matter, but always on the level of words. And in a world of living mysteries, we have sought to explain everything by naming elements naming factors, naming relationships. This naming process is, however, merely an instrument or a tool. It is a means, but man has gradually come to accept it as an end, so that he is now confident that if he can name the thing, he knows it. If he can communicate this name, he communicates learning. Actually, this entire procedure stimulates mostly memory, and the individual becomes profoundly burdened with names and words. Not long ago, we were discussing with a scholar the terrible profundity of the Chinese language. The Chinese language is an ideoglyphic language. That is, the, char the characters of the language were originally pictoglyphs. They resemble the object which they defined. Thus, they have a little figure that looks like a tree, and that is a tree in their language. And if they put two trees together, that is many trees. If they put three trees together, that is a forest or a vast accumulation of trees. Mm -hmm. Thus, by a simple symbolic procedure, they have created a symbol for an idea. They have a symbol for woman and a symbol for home. And if they put the woman symbol together with the home symbol or house symbol, then they have the concept of home as we know it, a psychological abode of persons united in certain interests. A woman in a house equals a home. Two women under the same roof equals chaos in Chinese. And it is not entirely inaccurate. <laughs> so, through experience, these glyphs have been devised. And my friend was concerned. He said, how have the Chinese ever learned 
to write and read a language in which there are more than 13,000 arbitrary glyphs and characters. Seems a preposterous undertaking. Well, the Chinese were very simple people in comparison to ourselves. Today, the average individual uses from 10 to 20,000 word forms. And these word forms for him must be memorized, must be accepted, must be available just exactly like the Chinese ideoglyphs. And if he is a scholar, he may need 50,000 of these word forms. Now we say that um, uh, because of language and structure, that we are able to grasp the words from their roots and so forth. The Chinese, however, do the same thing because they have stems and they have basic patterns which they develop, develop their word glyphs from. Actually, however, our use of language today depends upon our automatic memory of these word signs, these word symbols, which we can combine into an infinite diversity of patterns. And if we are clever and skillful in this, we have an able and available vocabulary. Now a vocabulary, unfortunately, to modern man, does not represent an equally abundant reservoir of ideas. Today our greatest technicians in words often have the least to say, but they say it magnificently. Other individuals limited in vocabulary may have a much greater quotient of ideas. So today, in most things, we follow the Aristotelian concept that if we have enough words available, we can control nearly any intellectual situation. Whether these words are backed by adequate ideas, not only has not been given proper consideration, but to the average person is meaningless. His entire concept of life today is upon surfaces. And if he can convey surface adequacy, what lies beneath is of slight concern to him. Not only, however, do we have this problem of words, but of course we have gradually developed our confusion of tongues, where we have many languages and dialects by which means of communication are restricted to groups and classes and areas. And while gradually this is being overcome, it is a slow and difficult procedure. Because of this language barrier, the ideas of mankind have been kept separate for a very long period of history. In fact, since the beginning of history. All these things have a bearing upon our major problem today. Because they point out that when we sit down to read a book, whatever that book may be, we are forced to consider our own ability, the difficulty in the transmission of ideas, and to a measure, of course, the authenticity or adequacy of the author. We must not confuse a well-turned phrase for a well-matured thought, and we all do it. We must not assume that because an individual has reputation that he has true knowledge. And not having these general criteria to base our judgment upon, we turn dismally from the realization that we are in no position to estimate the integrity of the work nor the validity of its premises. So the book comes to us from an unknown source. It comes to us far more limited uh, than its original message might imply. For example, today we pick up an available translation of Plato. Here was a man who lived 2400 years ago. Even with the most brutal mistranslation and inadequate interpretation, we observe traces of an extraordinary brilliance of mind, and a depth of penetration, and a largeness of spirit, all of which intrigue us. 
we must then consider what has happened to Plato. Let us remember also that most of these things which we now preserve of his were originally dialogues, that they were conversations, and that these conversations were nearly always, in one way or another, punctuated by mannerism. Ancient man conveyed more by the tone of his voice, by the inflections that he used, by a motion of his head, by a wry smile while speaking, by the raising of an eyebrow at a critical moment in discussion. These things carried overtones which cannot be carried in the printed or written word. Therefore, the voice, its persuasiveness, its melancholy, its depth, its hushed and muted whisper, all these different qualities by which we can awaken emotion, awaken reaction, point up, emphasize, all these are missing after the person who spoke has departed from this world of ours. We may be in a little better condition in the future because from now on we can keep in actual tonal form the words of great people, but the ancients did not have this skill. So today we have only a written, stenographic type of account of things that were said and done long ago. Now we have also the problem of language. Plato spoke one of the most learned languages of the world, what we call classical Greek. It was a magnificent language, but an astonishingly simple one. A language so simple that were we restricted today to its vocabulary, we would regard ourselves as underprivileged. And yet, with this limitation, it had certain insistences, certain values. And because it was not a total language as we think of it, it was a constant challenge to the listener. Where your written forms are inadequate, where your spoken forms are restricted, one word must mean many things. And the listener must immediately determine by an action of his own what meaning is required. Today we have lost even that exercise. Today we have words that will shade almost any idea so that it is no longer necessary for us to be alert to try to capture the meaning of these words. So we have the translation from Greek into English, and we have the rising personality of the translator. A translator in this case who lived nearly 2,000 years or away from the original. A translator who is not Greek, who did not live in their culture, who does not know their idiom, who has no way of appreciating what Plato really thought. By gradual process of induction and deduction, the translation takes on the appearance of what a scholar in 18th or 19th century England believed Plato to mean when Plato spoke 2400 years ago in Athens. Now this in itself presents a very large mystery because we, are, we cannot be sure, we have no way of knowing, to what degree the interpreter, the translator, by his own inevitable choosing, has selected terms which seem to him reasonable. He may be perfectly conscientious, completely honest, but he is still himself. And as in the case of dear old Dr. Jowett, who did one of the great translations of Plato, Dr. Jowett was honest, honorable, sincere, and a devout member of the Church of England. Plato knew nothing about the Church of England. And the Church of England does not, generally speaking, know too much about Plato. <laughs> so the combination is not entirely satisfactory. <laughs> but assuming that Jowett did the best he could, and rescued perhaps 60, 70, 80 percent accuracy in his own interpretation of Plato's meaning. Now comes the next important equation, and that is the reader. 
The reader lives just another hundred years or further away from Plato than Dr. Jowett did. Also, the reader does not have Dr. Jowett's lifetime of research and study at Barlow College in Oxford. The average reader is not a person totally, completely devoted to classical learning. He has very little actual, vital concept of Greek life. He has no immediate familiarity with the abstract speculations of Plato's mind. So he reads. And instead of bringing uh, to the uh, message the limitation that Dr. Jowett brought, who was limited by the fact that he only had 70 years of philosophy to live by, the modern reader picks it up with the additional limitation that he has about 15 minutes of philosophy to <laughs> convey and bestow from himself. Now, this is not universally true. Some people may have studied quite intensively and quite industriously from various interpretations, various translations. They have tried. They have been thoughtful. But they have also learned by now that the different translations that they have read were not in agreement. And therefore, there is a considerable uh, interval here. But actually, Presuming that we are reading, and presuming that we were reading the correct words, the actual words spoken by Plato, and that we had a full grammatical knowledge of the structure and the meaning of those words, still, what have we to give out of ourselves to make these words come alive? so that they are not any longer merely collections of letters that have to be sought out in a dictionary. When Plato refers to the mind in some context, do we have a living concept of what mind is? Or do we merely regard it as some mysterious assembly of factors uh, operating through the brain or in some way associated to the brain. When we look up mind in the dictionary and find intellect as a meaning, are we advanced? Or if we look up intellect and discover that it is a manifestation of the mind, where are we? We are dealing on our own level with ideas that have not been experienced or known as living facts within ourselves. Therefore, we cannot depend upon these words to bestow living facts. This brings us into another interesting equation. We learned from Pythagoras nearly 2,600 years ago that the definitions of things are best attained from the intervals between them and not from the things themselves. In this case, the intervals represent spacing and words. Various words leading up to a word. Various words dependent upon a word. Usage, arrangement, organization, and what we might term text structure. These things help us in a new way, because by combining words we develop a certain vitality, and in the total idea we may find something that stimulates and stirs us where words would not. Thus, whatever stimulation we get from words is not from the words themselves, but from their relationships. And through their relationships, words impel a concept or imply an idea. And an idea is a luminous sense of sudden awareness. The word becomes meaningful because of association. And because of this sudden meaningfulness from within ourselves, we come into acceptance or rejection, if we are not very learned, and if we are more learned, we come into consideration of the statement that has been made. 
If we are very, very gullible, we will accept. If we are very skeptical, we may reject. Both courses are unprofitable. If, however, we are sufficiently intelligent to consider and have something in the form of power which enables us to consider, then perhaps we shall be on the way toward uh, a broadening or deepening of some value within ourselves. Consideration means that we must have within our own nature some faculty or power that responds to the stimulus of an idea. Because no idea can have a meaning for us that in some way is not within our experience or within our own total ability to comprehend. If it is incomprehensible, it simply means that it does not awaken any reaction in ourselves, either of interest or of indifference. <laughs> then we learn by degrees that the great use of words is to draw something out of ourselves, and that the text we read is a sort of catalyst, an agency, by means of which we see reflected in the words of others the ideas which are in ourselves. And learning is thus a drawing forth out of the internal of certain convictions which we hope to advance, certain ideas which we hope to sustain, certain mysteries which we hope to solve. And reading on these levels becomes the basis of what we hope will prove to be an increase of knowledge or of an advancement of ourselves in some useful way. Now, of course, there are forms of reading uh, in which material is so technically presented and so obviously experienced around us as in trades and crafts that the combination of the text and instruction and apprenticeship still produces the skilled mechanic, still enables the person to grasp certain practices and policies and thereby increase the probability of a successful livelihood. This is not the type of material with which we are primarily concerned at the moment, however, because this is obviously supplemented by certain apprenticeship. Now, in abstract ideas, however, particularly as they relate to religion, philosophy, psychology, and things of that nature, one of our problems is the difficulty of apprenticeship. We have an increasing store of ideas, such as they are, mostly derived from other sources, but certainly sustained by some strength within ourselves. We try to put these ideas to work, and we find that because they are not clearly defined in themselves, they do not produce a clearly defined consequence. We tell someone something for his own good. We use words. We hope he understands. He understands according to what he is, and he acts according to what he is. Perhaps our recommendation or suggestion stirs him into some action. Perhaps it does not. Perhaps the action which he makes is not actually consistent with the recommendation we made, because it is only his interpretation of it. But gradually, through a period of time, certain things happen. But by that time, the person who made the suggestion is no longer following the case history closely. He has made numerous other suggestions and is in so many difficulties as a result that he does not have time to check any one of them. He gradually comes to the conclusion that he cannot clarify the consequences of his own ideas in action. And he is further hampered by the fact that the last person to whom he applies his ideas is himself. And yet he is the only one through whom he could get a case history. If he did it himself, he would know the results. But if he tosses it into society promiscuously, he will never know the results. Because it will be like a stone falling in water. It will leave a little ripple, sink to the bottom, and disappear from sight. Innumerable ideas have been swallowed up 
by the vast mass motions of humanity since the dawn of time. And it is difficult indeed to discriminate or determine the exact merit of these various ideas. Now when we come to literature or to the written word, we observe, however, that there has been a consistent kind of censorship down through time. Man reaching out for knowledge, seeking in the great written record of his people and now of the whole world, for some thing to advance his own patterns of living, has gradually exercised a censoring power over the productions of his fellow men. Those books which have survived from great ages, these texts, ideas, even quotations, truisms, aphorisms that have come down to us out of the remote past, most of these have lived because future generations be, uh, to be born after their original statement have perpetuated these ideas, that man has carried them on, giving them life from his own vitality because the original vitality ceased when the idea uh, was committed to the common mind. But the common mind preserved it, vitalized it, and perpetuated it, handing it down as valuable, useful, or important. <clears throat> Where this has occurred over a long period of time, we have what is called authority. An authority, or the censorship of ages, involving both the nature, dignity, estate, and conduct of the originating source of the idea, plus the admiration in which it has been held over long periods of time. These together constitute a kind of recommendation which will influence the modern thinker or the modern seeker to assume that these ideas must be important. He will soon come to the realization, of course, that different kinds of ideas about the same thing have been so perpetuated, and therefore that the value of ideas is broken into schools of thought, and each school perpetuates that which it regards as most useful, necessary, or vital. Today, therefore, modern man comes into a literature <laughs> of which probably some 20 to 25 million different pieces are available to him in many languages and relating to an infinity of subjects. He is in the presence of the accumulation of all past knowledge. While he does not realize it, he is also in possession within himself of a vast accumulation of past experience moving through his bloodstream, moving through his psychic life. He believes in reincarnation, moving from previous existences. So that the individual today 